I call to order the meeting of the uh, Rocket Planning Commission for um, June 14th, 2023. This will be the Land Use Code Working Group meeting. Um, we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll have um, I'm wondering, I'm taking notes um, in attendance. We have a new member with us this this evening, and it might be beneficial for the World Cup. We could maybe just do a real quick All right, we'll name who you're, you know, if you're a board member, so on, etc. Okay, great. I'll go ahead and start. Um, my name is Darcy Thomas. I am the commission chair. Joe Smith, Planning Commission. Frank Pebbles, Planning Commission. Grant Smith, Willis Ackrat. Uh, Seth White, I guess, uh, at large member from the whole town. Thank you, Lynn, at large member uh, of business. Guy Higgins, Senior Advisory Board. Uh, Nick Hartman, at large outside Old Town. Kate Williams, Lockett, Urban Renewal Authority. Doug Conroe, Historic Preservation Board. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lauren Fickner, Administrative Coordinator. Uh, Jeff Brazel, the Planning and Building Director. Mark Forty, Planning Commission. Kel Stevens, Planning Commission. Walker Lafayette, Human Rights Commission. Yeah, I'm Planning Planning. And I'm Nora Bland. I'm with the, the consulting team with the Shitown. We'll move on to item two. I'm reviewing some meeting notes from the last. Um, are there any edits on the meeting notes that we sent out? Um, are we capturing the right amount of detail? Any comments at the point? No news is good news. Okay, we'll move on. Um, photo and zoning and zoning. Yeah, so thanks so much for your time um, this evening. Uh, we're looking forward to the discussion. Um, so we have a team here, myself, Jeff Brazel, Lauren, um, Nora, and then on online tonight is uh, Nolan um, with uh, Zone Co. Is, yep, Nolan. Um, and um, so the bulk of the meeting agenda was really focused on the code organization, kind of the organizing principle of our code. Um, and the new zone. So we've provided some information and we've tried to work hard to just get it um, as graphically um, user-friendly as possible. So we heard a lot about like pictures and Google pins and things like that. So we tried to get all that to you. Um, and so what we'll do is provide a brief presentation on um, recapping and then going a little bit deeper into some of the stuff you heard um, last uh, month or two months ago about uh, conventional and form-based codes and then dive into the organizing principle. What is it? What are some different options out there we've considered? And then what's what's the recommendation? We'll then pause as a group and, and kind of ask the question, um, given that, do you have any clarifying, question, uh, clarifying questions or a pulse check of, are these heading in the right direction? Or are we way off track and need to rethink this? Um, then we are gonna propose that we, we have some handouts here, those snapshots that we printed out or uh, sent out uh, earlier in the week. Um, kind of groups of two or three um, and spend some time kind of digging in into the different zones and seeing um, what the intent statements look like, um, the desired form, and any of those key issue questions that were identified, um, and then reporting back out. Um, per the last meeting, we also talked about having some public comment, and so there'll be an opportunity to also um, speak as well. Um, and then Jeff's going to provide a brief update on the state bills because the General Assembly session has concluded. Um, so tonight's goal is the, the really the core thing that we're laser focused on is to reach a consensus about the organizing principle or zone districts and intent statements. Um, it's a really important conversation. Um, this is kind of foundational to a lot of the work that we'll do down the line. And so it'll be really important to make sure like the house is built on a solid foundation. Um, and with that, we also um, you know, understand that we threw a lot of information at everyone and there might need to be more conversations. And so we also don't want you to feel rushed. And so if we need to have another meeting to pick this back up, that's perfectly okay as well. 
Um, it doesn't have to be perfect. So the question we'll ask you, is it good enough for now? Uh, and so down the road, you know, we don't want to make huge changes so that can be disruptive, but um, you know, we can also, we can always tweak things as we move along and learn more. So last month, um, two months ago, the last meeting, um, you heard a bit from Nolan um, about the different ways that zoning codes are organized. And traditionally, they've been organized around uses. We call those conventional codes. Um, they've been around for quite a while. More recently, form-based codes have kind of taken some, a lot of folks have been interested in that, specifically offsetting some of the design and other um, issues that have, have, has arisen with the, with the use-based approach. And then some communities you heard um, kind of take a little bit of both um, and apply form-based codes in some areas based on the context and, and goals and then use base codes and the others. Um, we're kind of looking at that hybrid approach. Um, and what we'd like to do is talk a little bit about the use and the form-based code piece before diving into the um, organizing principle part. Um, and so in thinking about this, one of the conversations that we typically get or questions is, you know, there's a person and maybe they're a developer, um, maybe they do small projects, but they see a property and they call us and say, you know, I see this thing here, it's on the market, what can I build? Um, with a conventional zoning scheme, a lot of times and this is very um, oversimplified is, um, that's a great question. We have this list of uses that you probably need to start with. Um, and so a lot, at that point, the applicant for prospective applicant kind of looks at that list of uses. They look at some of the different standards and they figure out I can probably build this this much development. So this this much commercial, this many units of residential. Um, and it's at that point where they start their due diligence. They'll start maybe looking at some options to purchase. They'll um, do some fundraising and everything. And it all kind of probably ties back to that amount of development they're anticipating. Um, the, and then to get there, they can develop this pro forma, this Excel spreadsheet that plugs in all of those numbers to see if the project will actually pencil out. And so the uses then, the type of use and the amount of use really drives all those standards. And so how many parking spaces do I need? How many trees and shrubs do I need? Is it, what's the process look like? Is it a buy right process or is it a discretionary special review that's going to add some time to this? And so all of that's pretty easy to kind of calculate and get through in a conventional code. Um, but then the next step is really that negotiated outcome. And so I think a lot of communities um, would, would, were seeing some of the outcomes of this and, and started to develop things like design guidelines and plan unit developments. And so a lot of communities in Colorado, including ours, do plan unit developments. These are two of the criteria um, from our PUD. Um, uh, criteria, um, and you'll see things like shall encourage residential developments to contribute, um, uh, 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 shall be compatible with and respect the context of its location. And, you know, we've gotten a lot of really good projects in Lafayette um, by, by really negotiating a good outcome through this. Um, but a lot of times it, it can lead to some limited predictability for the applicant in the city and the community. And, and a lot of times, um, you can, can interpret this differently. And so the developer can have a much different vision for what that means relative to the community, city staff turnover. And so our approach to this might you know, evolve over time. Um, and so at times it can lead to you know, some, some conflict and some, some unpredictability. And so the um, conventional codes really, it takes the setbacks, the height, all of the other factors, and it kind of draws a kind of a 3D box around the kind of property where you can build in and you can have a lot of different outcomes. Some communities were seeing some concerns, and so as, including Lafayette adopted some design guidelines. Um, but a lot of times, um, especially with some of the larger projects, maybe that doesn't get to the core issue, which is a lot of times like the size of the footprint of the building, the context of that site versus the surrounding properties. And so I think like over the years, the foreign based codes were really developed and came on the scene to really try to get a better um, relationship between the buildings and the blocks and the open spaces and, and so on. And so that's kind of a iteration. And, and one of the comments at the previous meeting, question or comment was, um, are we trying to kind of micromanage um, development for the next 30 years with this code? And I, I think the answer was no. 
And um, in thinking through that a little bit more, has anyone seen the great British baking show? This was a COVID <laughs> favorite um, in our household. Um, but I, I think the way this works is that they get the recipes and they say, we need a windmill cake. And maybe they get like the ingredients of flour and eggs and so on. But they don't, I don't think they get, you need five eggs, you need a cup and a half of milk and a cup of flour. Um, and we need it to look this certain way, but it, instead it's, we need a windmill cake. And so in thinking of the ingredients of a great cake, I think it's kind of like the ingredients of a great neighborhood where we're saying we want walkable blocks and here are some basic standards for those. We want public spaces. And so we want those thought about early in the process. And here are some basic dimensional standards to get there. Um, and we, we, we're gonna talk about where buildings should be placed on a property and so on. And so it's not necessarily micromanaging, but it's trying to get the ingredients in place to allow that um, a more certain outcome, a windmill cake. Um, it, but instead of that, it's a complete neighborhood or a vibrant you know, community um, space or, or so on. So that was the way my brain thought about it for better or worse. Uh, um, the, um, so since we are doing a hybrid code, um, you know, just some of the differences between the use base and the form base. I know, Jeff, if you have any additions to this, feel free to, to chime in as well. But uses are really focused on, you know, the use, and that determines kind of where you can, um, where, what the locations are and the sites are that you can um, pursue that. Um, the parking is generally fairly broad with the number of spaces and dimensions, but not necessarily some of the design considerations that are sometimes a concern with folks. Um, landscaping, the PED criteria, and so on. Whereas the form-based codes have, they also have the locations and zones, but they have different things that we'll be diving into in the next few meetings, like building types. Um, so the different types of buildings re relative to the context, um, the frontage types, so how the build, how the fronts of buildings kind of um, interface with the public space in front of it. So a shop front versus a, a porch in a neighborhood, a porch front. Um, civic spaces, so thinking about parks and open space and those things early in the process. And so if you're subdividing land, think identifying those areas up front instead of having any leftover parcels serve that purpose. And so those kinds of things. Um, the location of parking is typically, um, um, uh, in a lot of cases, um, dictated in a form-based code. Um, and then the review processes are, are slightly different. But overall, I mean, you, you spaces, use space codes have that singular focus on a lot, and they were born out of a, of a lot of um, successes from planners of separating uses to, and it led to a lot of increases in quality of life. So getting like the manufacturing away from the residences and so on. Um, it's kind of evolved into um, what it is today. Um, and, um, and then the form-based code, we were thinking of it as it kind of considers the broader context of the area around it while still allowing for that latitude to be creative and to have those eclectic projects. That, yeah. Um, so the main event tonight is the organizing principle. Um, and so we'd like to just highlight a few of the different organizing principles we've seen out there and then the staff, staff's recommendation. Um, so there's different components in a form-based code. There's a, a regulating plan, which is basically a zoning map um, it looks a lot like a zoning map. And then there's different building types, frontage types, and civic space types. Um, these are pretty standard components in a, in a form-based code, and we'll be diving into these um, and really um, uh, going into it in the next uh, meeting or the next two meetings. But there's a few different organizing principles that we've come across. The one is the rural to urban transect. And I think, Grant, you may have um, noted this last time, yeah. in the last meeting. Yeah, so this is the most popular way to organize a code. And so when we, I guess, backing up an organizing principle in the conventional code is uses and everything is tied back to that use. Um, in this case, everything is tied back to this transect. And the transect is really just talking about those gradual transitions of context. And so a natural area versus a rural area, and then leading all the way into an urban, an urban core. Um, I think it got its roots in ecology. That top right um, diagram, that visual shows um, ecologists would kind of divvy up different portions of an ecosystem and say, in that place, it has its own unique context, its own unique considerations. 
And then somebody got the idea um, to start applying that to city planning, which is pretty it's a human con human uh, habitat. Um, it it is pretty flexible, so you can have sub zones of so T four point one two and so on to really match the context um, that you're trying to to achieve. Um, this is you know, I don't know how to make that go away, but that says streets. So another organizing principle that we've seen, no, you don't have to worry about it. Sure. Yeah, it's fine. Don't worry. Um, is organizing um, by streets. And so in this case, the standards um, link back to the type of street that the property is adjacent to. And so in this case, it's probably hard to see, but there's a map with different color streets. There's like the four lane avenue, the main street, the, the neighborhood lane, and so on. And so if you're on that street, then that defines what kinds of um, requirements that you need to meet. Um, this typically includes a cross section of what that street looks like, what are the facilities on that street, and then the adjacent requirements. Um, a pro on this approach that we looked at is that we're adopting a transportation plan pretty soon, and so that might be a good implementation item. But um, in talking with Zone Co and others, it's a much less common approach to this type of zoning, and it could lead to a lot of complexity in the code. Um, and um, we don't have a ton of different street types in Latvia, and so even on a north on a, the same street, you can see a lot of different contexts. And so we didn't see a very viable path for that here, but wanted to note it. The other one is frontage. So different frontage types is basically just referring to how the how the building interacts with that public realm. And so the map here shows shades along the streets, and this is a main street frontage and avenue frontage. And so we'll talk about frontage types in Lafayette, but this is really the core feature. And so instead of saying, these are the list of allowed uses, you say, what street are you on? And that tells you the, 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 um, the types of um, regulations or the, the frontage, what that, that's the type of regulations. Um, this really emphasizes how the building interacts with the public realm, but again, it felt like it's, it's not common. It can get really complicated um, here in Lafayette. So we're not recommending that. What we are recommending is it's kind of a nod to that transect, but it's really focusing on context. And this was in kind of thinking about the comprehensive plan, there was a really a lot of um, discussion about um, urban design guidance and ensuring that um, communities are complete and that the context, the broader context is considered. And so we've broken up the proposed zones into four categories, um, the neighborhoods. And so that would be kind of the core of the community really intended to create complete, unique, and interesting neighborhoods. Um, centers, so linking the neighborhoods kind of together um, with different activities like working and, and shopping and attending school and so on. Um, corridors, um, and I'm also kind of linking the community together in the districts, um, which is typically a single special use, um, open space, parks, um, public schools, and city halls and things like that. And so um, it's really that direct link to the comp plan when we were thinking about this. And um, the districts that um, the proposed zones that were in the packet are, are shown here. Um, it, at a high level, it was really we tried to focus on context. Um, and you'll notice that um, we also, I guess, context and the ability to have it not only a clear code, but we can to amend it easily over time. And so um, one of the things that you'll notice is that there's three neighborhood two zones. And so the two refers to the anticipated number of stories. But even in the residential areas, while there are two stories, the context is much different. Um, and so just to um, we'll get back to that in just a second. Um, at the end of the day, we'd expect a lot of the standards that you're used to seeing in, in, in codes to also carry forward to this code. So we would have allowable building forms. So setbacks in the more rural and suburban areas, probably build two lines in areas where we want the building a little closer to the street. Um, we would look at the locations of building and parking on the sites. Um, and then the lot coverage would kind of shift depending on the context. There would be subdivision standards, again, getting the civic spaces in on the front end. Um, and then those general standards that everyone loves, uh, parking and, and landscaping and so on. Planners love. 
Okay. Well, I'm sure everyone. That's a, that's a that's a brave statement. Yeah, that's true. That's um, debatable. Um, so at a high level, um, this is a just a diagram showing that rural to urban kind of context as it relates to building types, and it's hard to see here, but it kind of just shows um, the progression of more intense building types from a rural estate home, you know, to a duplex and a triplex, all the way to a, an urban core. Um, and as you move move, you know, to the right, the lot sizes, you know, get a little bit get a little smaller. The locations of buildings change. Maybe there's the introduction of alleys and, and different types of buildings. Um, you'll notice so tonight, like we're not diving into the types of buildings. We'll get there next. But um, tonight is kind of the higher level of like, OK, there's a rural aspect to Lafayette. And we've tried to tr craft an intense statement to describe what the vision is for those rural areas. Um, so maybe think of it as this whole block of what what would that kind of vision be? Um, and then other zones like the neighborhood two zone may encompass you know, a broader array of these different housing types and block sizes, um, whereas the, the rural areas have undefined lots and deep setbacks and a really low lot coverage. These areas are starting to have more defined lots, um, shallower setbacks, and then getting into like the neighborhood three zone, where there's different building types, there's apartments, um, shallow setbacks, high lot coverage, and, and so on. Um, we we try to just put this together next to the transect because I know there's there's probably some interest in that. Um, there's, I mean, I think you could relate it back to the transect pretty easily in that you know the neighborhood to rural could probably be pretty similar to the rural zone and sub suburb suburban zone of the transect. Um, and then the you know general urban would be pretty similar to neighborhood two, which is you would think of like the Indian Peaks and the medium density residential one and two family areas in Lafayette. And then the neighborhood three being a bit more intense in that T5 urban center. So there's definitely a connection. There's a lot of nods to context. It's just organized a bit differently than the transact. Um, so we wanted to purposely try not to take up too much time here um, and kind of go dive into some of the group discussion. What we'd like to propose, unless there's a, a better idea um, out there, um, and before we went into the group discussion, I think you wanted to take a temperature check yeah. on the overall program. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so um, we thought that it might be uh, a change of pace a little bit to be able to kind of break into some some groups. We have printed out those snapshot things and have some discussions um, kind of going through those different zones to see is that intent statement really capturing what it needs to capture, um, key issues that we need to work through and so on. Um, but before we dive into that, we wanted to allow some space for folks to kind of ask some clarifying questions and to just get a temperature check of like, is this workable? Is this, are we heading in a okay direction? Because there's no point in going to those, those small group sessions if, if folks are concerned about the overall direction. Our, in the group discussion, can we group pieces around? Get back to you, or do you want to talk about that now? Spread out a little bit more. Can pieces. you go back to the transition? For, yeah. um, this, this, the size and this multiplex small courtyard apartment, mm -hmm. large scale, both of those. Mm -hmm. in, in between is the cottage court, which is really an up and coming trend. and speaks to affordability more than anything on this chart mm -hmm. is that cottage court and moving that back down into yeah. into this duplex triplex or two i mean you, you you're like boring boring interesting boring, boring, boring. why not why not encourage people to do something interesting back yeah back on this side yeah that, that's a great comment so like looking at the building forms Looking at what what the menu of building forms in each zone context is a, an important next step um, that we need to do. But right now we want to make sure. So we have is our approach to the zone districts at a very high level the right approach, like the context based approach, 
the differentiating within context by height. Um, is that the right approach? And if so, are the intent statements, um, we tried to use the intent statements and draw them back to the comp plan. Are they, are we properly setting the foundation? And then once we agree on all that, this is, I, I personally agree, this is the fun stuff, right? We're gonna look at our existing neighborhoods. We're gonna look at our new neighborhoods through like a much more um, engaging, potentially workshop or shred process and ask, what are the what is the palette of housing that we want to see within our community? What is the palette of housing we want to see within our existing neighborhoods? And how do we start forming the details of each zone district? So yeah, you're thinking right, Doug, you're just about two steps ahead of us right now. So you know there's no harm in a, yeah. in writing that stuff no. down or sharing it because we'll yeah. be gathering no, information. That, that's understood. That. This your approach is the closest to what we already have, and that's encouraging. It's not that big of a leap. Going to that street mode or to those other ones that you talked about is a pretty big leap. But this, yeah. you know, you're, you're you're reordering some things, and you're thinking in how we've done it before, um, and that's good. It's it's a sensible way to move forward. So, I think. Go ahead. We just popcorn. <laughs> what happens if the districts change over time? I mean, how do you accommodate for that? If a certain area, for instance, um, becomes there's more infill, for instance, in neighborhood two, or there's um, I don't know, the collective flex, you know, allows for commercial districts to become, you know, multi-use. So how would that accommodate that? Yeah, so that's that's part of like the details discussion, right? So with there's there's a broad answer to that question. So I'm trying to think of a good example. Um so like say the neighborhood two zone district, like as we work collectively in this group, we decide that this the neighborhood two needs to include these types of housing types, um, and it's and and it incorporates desired change within that that neighborhood. So there's an intentional change being built into the code from day one, or we can decide that no, the purpose of neighborhood two is to really um, conserve and protect what's the character in place at this time. So we have a very narrow palette of of housing types within our existing neighborhoods. But the framework's there that should we do sub area planning or um, additional planning and community outreach? And we say, you know what, this name, we're getting a lot of interest in this particular area that it wants to evolve because of a variety of reasons. Um, uh, the, 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 per, the, the rationale behind that is we would do planning around that and then come back and re look at zoning to see if the zoning is, is sufficient for that planning. Or on a broader conversation, is neighborhood two what we intended it to be? And if not, how do we update the zoning code to reflect the community expectations um, as they evolve over time? So there's kind of a different approaches to that, but we start somewhere. That's what part of the, this working group is, is going to work. Code starts somewhere. Can we create a code that can adapt over time, either through additional planning or just structurally? It can account, you can plug in new building forms within existing districts and so forth. So it, that was one of the goals of this project is to have a code that can evolve, that can be flexible, that can meet um, changing needs over time in an intentional and thoughtful way. Um, and that, that's what we're trying to get to. Yeah. So you're envisioning that planning, for instance, with the planning commission or the council and say, we think this code should evolve in this way based on X, and then it would evolve. Yeah, that there would be some sort of community engagement around it, the zoning code amendment. And then we would craft the standards that would need to change in, in the existing code. But like, I think the more likely outcome is like, we look at an area um, and we do a, a sub area plan or a neighborhood plan. And as part of that, listening to the, to the people that live in, in that area where the businesses that reside in that area and then telling us, hey, this isn't meeting our long-term needs. We would like to evolve as a neighborhood. What does that look like? 
And then you do that planning, you do that visioning and planning outside of any zoning code, and a zoning code update would follow that, kind of like what we're doing here on a citywide scale, but it's on a neighborhood scale. Can I, can I ask, you, you said we're doing the, the proposal is the hybrid kind of contact control. Why, why are we going hybrid? Well, I think uh, when we were considering it, it often works really well for areas that are more kind of walkable and and urban. And then in some of the suburban contexts and rural contexts, like it, it may or may not be an overkill of, of regulations and process. And so the thought was that if there's literally just a, there's some cities in Colorado that have a, this is a, X zone preserve versus X zone evolve. And so those preserved ones might just have a that the normal process that we're used to. Yeah. yeah. Something we can all yeah. talk about. If we want it to look and feel the same in the code, we don't want it to be like two different codes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two codes, but yeah, and I also think there's an expectation that there's still some separation of uses within the community. Mm -hmm. Um, like if we were to take a purist form-based code approach. Um, use is a, a consideration, but not the driving factor. So you would potentially be opening up neighborhoods um, to multiple uses that those neighborhoods aren't used to. And that's not in the comp plan right now. Um, and so that would be kind of a, 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 a more radical shift than what's envisioned with, with this um, with this approach. So there is a need to do, um, to regulate somewhat by uses in certain areas of the community. And then other areas are more receptive, like our new development areas on um, Main Street, like the Road, are more um, focused around um, design goals and expectations, and where the form-based code can take a, a bigger role in that in that context. It'll be, I mean, I guess I'm having a little problem with that, your transition concept. Take, for example, and right behind us, you have strapped more apartments. And right next door is a mobile home park. Mm -hmm. So are you envisioning this setup that would enforce more gradual transitions? Or at least that's the impression I got from that whole little ecological drawing there. I, I have um, a photo. So I think in like transitions and context, like this is just from a, a video, a training, and it was talking about building forms and each of these met the current zoning for height and for okay. bulk and mass and everything, but they're very different buildings. And so the one on the left is a, a lined building. It's still, you know, it's, it's perfectly nice looking. And the other is more of a, um, what is it, a house scale instead of a block scale. They have the same number of units, but they're much, the mass, the massing is much different. And I think, some of these things, the so do you see those being intermixed? Well, we would probably we would probably see this like building on the right would be much more context sensitive to the one on the left if it was the project being built, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah Frank, I you're I think I understand what you're asking, but we don't know all these details yet. We have to engage with. I'm just being conceptually. Yeah, yeah, yeah but like the most. We one of the complaining things around mobile. Maybe the example you're using is not a good example, but mobile homes need their own zone district, mm -hmm. and um, and the end of the create. It's one of the special context districts is mobile homes. Um, but what about what's next to them? Yeah, old town residential, right? Um, and so somewhere in the regulations, like the comprehensive plan, talks about um, responding to adjacency in neighborhood context. And so in the building form regulations, there will probably be a concept relating to transition and height down into a, a surrounding zone district that is lesser intense. So using a real world example, uh, example baseline might be a, a great, um, a more appropriate example. If you have a B1 zone district right now along baseline, um, even in Old Town on Public Road, you have a B1 zone district, suburban, Development zone, commercial zone district. Um, it allows taller buildings, but there's nothing in there's nothing in our B one zone district that talks about how that three stories needs to transition down to the two stories, which is allowed in the which is a neighborhood. So um, there will be a feature within these building 
forms that talk about if you're adjacent to a different neighborhood context, there has to be some sort of height step in where you have incongruous allowances. Um, that's what our thought is. Um, Denver does it in, in a way called protected zone districts, like certain zone districts are identified as protected. And so if you have a, um, if you have, um, say a commercial zone district that's adjacent to or across from an alleyway that is a um, housing zone district, they have like in the rear certain percentage of the lot, you have, you're have you limited to one story or something like that. That's one way to do it. There might be other mechanisms that we'll have to explore on how to do that. I am. Some of the commercial and corridor districts will really, I'm struggling to really understand the differences. I guess I wondered how fine grain, and how do you know if you're too fine grain or too general on how many distinct districts you pick? Like there's the neighborhood center and the adaptable commercial corridor and the adaptable commercial district. And I, I just was struggling a little to understand the difference, the differences in the intent between them and when you needed three or is that many? Yeah, um, this will be a great <laughs> conversation in our small groups. Um, when you look at adaptable commercial and the comprehensive plan, it talks about taking big, big lots and breaking them down into small, smaller lots and having more neighborhood development. But there are areas um, in the city where the lot size is, is a lot depth of one. And so you can't really break that down into smaller components. And so our thought was is that it's the same context, but it's a it's a different lotting pattern. And so whereas the district might have requirements that if you're over and it, and we map we have to map these things too, so that's important. So if we have a parcel big enough that it can be broken down into smaller lots. Um, that would be under a district type zoning, whereas and it would be required there would be a requirement to do that, as opposed to these linear. Mm -hmm. um, corridors where you, the lots are only so deep, you can't really put another public road through it. And so you need to treat those differently. Um, there might not be the subdivision requirement to break it down into smaller lots. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And does that just, does that explain what the neighborhood center feel is also somehow? Yeah, the neighborhood center is, it equates to the neighborhood mixed use typology in the comp plan. And when you look when you look in the city where these neighborhood centers are, they're on shallower development parcels. Some of them you might be able to break into smaller blockable blocks, but some of them you can't. So it's a very similar concept. We we might like as we get in into this deeper, we might say, you know what, we don't need this zone district as we look at where we're trying to map these things. Or we might say, you know what, we need a corridor zone district for this type of location. Um, conceptually though, that's kind of the kind of what we're trying to set up. And the neighborhood center is kind of that 15 minute neighborhood concept of ideally there it's a scale that's compatible with the, the neighborhood and it's providing some goods and services that may be of a benefit to folks there um, yeah. in, that, in, the, in those areas. The adaptable commercial corridor being like a Sherman Williams, going back to that uh, kind of a single lot. Whereas a big box re redevelopment might be that district. So it's, it's, this is a way of, of taking what you've already got and figuring out how to design something that is realistic. Yeah. Yeah. And that is more closely following the complex. And that's what that's what this is all filtering from. So when we analyze this, we have to think of it in terms of does this match and that's what that has done. Does this match what we've already decided as a as a community? Um, how does this compare in terms of the number? It seems like there's fewer districts, okay, which is good. Yeah, I don't know the actual number we have now, but yeah. it's, it's, there's probably fewer. Sorry. I'm struggling to differentiate between the developing resource area and the ag land. Can you clarify the difference with those? Yeah, we. Uh, we were the districts, all of those districts, I think is probably the separate meeting conversation okay. because they're they're so unique. And I think there's still there's wildlife planning efforts going on and things that we want to consider, but the developing resource is really a holding zone. So if we annexed a property, but we didn't know they didn't know what they wanted to do, but we annexed it. 
it basically says the use that's there when we annex it can continue, um, or these other uses, which are pretty pretty um, limited in agriculture. Yeah, but ag is is ag. Yeah. And, yeah. So we can talk, I think, uh, when the time comes about is developing resource really needed. The comp plan has a designation to it. Should we just zone it what we want? Thank you. Thank you. Well, developing resources a while back used to be more common, and that apparently it saves money for the yeah. developer to come in and do an annexation and plan and everything in one shot. Yeah. So I haven't seen a lot of developing yeah. resources. It's usually straight to something. I think through the engagement, that's probably a good opportunity to do some targeted conversations with the folks, the property owners of those, to get a better sense of what their long-term goals are and whether or not that matches up with what we're doing. And could we just straight sell it now? Or not? Yeah, we kept it in there because it's in the code right now, but we don't know what to do with it yet. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. I noticed kind of just conceptually with the the graphic that you had from rural to urban core, you know, you get like more bulk, higher buildings, etc. And and in some of these neighbor in some of these districts, you have three story buildings, but not in the on the main street. It's just two two story, which is a little antithetical to traditional, to like whatever you call that. Um, or can you talk about that a little bit? What? I wasn't here when that was done in the comp plan, but I know that was a discussion, right? Vicki, do you want to talk about that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is that in the comp plan? It is. It's more the expert on that. Yeah, no, no, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Yeah, there was very intentional um, uh, discussion in the comp plan around public road. And that um, that Main Street in particular, three story, is not something that's desired um, in public road. It might be um, that in outside of public road. So as there, like downtown, our downtown has concept of three main streets: South Public Road, East Simpson, and Baseline. Um, and so West Baseline might look different than Public Road as far as height. Um, but Public Road was intentionally set at two stories. Is there a reason why that third story doesn't exist on public road? I think because of community uh, community. community feedback, yeah. There's been a lot of pushback on that. I guess I've got a couple of comments. I mean, I think first off, I'd really like to uh, <clears throat> have you guys put the packet together. Um, yeah, it was pretty good. The little links, descriptions of the zones and stuff. So. Uh, yeah, that's a good material. And then also, um, you know, overall in this sort of context-based um, uh, approach to 